Yes, hi everyone. Um, so uh, I feel a little bit of an imposter talking here today. I, I'm not a space scientist. I was very much interested in this planet. Uh, as you heard, I did my PhD here and I was actually studying stratosphere-troposphere coupling. So how two different layers of the atmosphere talk to each other. But uh, I can rest, I, please rest assured that I'm a massive sci-fi nerd. I uh, actually wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. That's why I did physics at uh, university. So uh, I have some credentials to be here. But I am going to be talking about science communication. And uh, before diving into that, I want to talk a bit about why this is important. And to do that, I wanted to talk about, first of all, something that I'm sure we're not sick of hearing about, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the pandemic was obviously a nightmare. And one of the reasons it was a nightmare was the sheer level of misinformation and misunderstanding of the virus and of our response to it. And that misinformation, that misunderstanding was caused by a variety of factors. It was caused by easy access to both scientific and non-scientific information, particularly on social media. And that combined with insufficient scientific and statistical literacy. Those two together were, I think, a large part of this problem, but they weren't the only components. You also had this uh, thing, which I know a little bit about, but I'm pretty confident is a, a cognitive bias. Um, you've got the design of social media sites favoring controversial content. So Twitter and YouTube, their algorithmic feeds favor content that generates lots of comments, the lots, of, lots of likes and dislikes, and that drives misinformation. You've also got this idea of ideating conspiracies, people wanting to believe in conspiracy theories such as surrounding uh, the pandemic, such as the Illuminati or landing, man lot landing on the moon. And one of the principal reasons for that is there being large economic and political disenfranchisement. Now, this is not just limited to the COVID pandemic. This is also the set of parameters surrounding other crises, such as the climate crisis. Given my background, you may not be surprised to hear that I think this is very important. And as we've seen in the pandemic, misinformation is damaging. This is a really big problem. And effective science communication is important because I think this is a problem. And has this got a pointer? Oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and a termination switch. There we go. Oh, it's back. Um, I, I think that this is a really big problem, and this is the area that I can contribute to, given my skill set. And so this is what I have made my job since graduating. So I did my PhD here. I would describe myself now as a recovering academic, um, uh, because alongside my academic career as an undergraduate and, and postgraduate, I was also making videos, and that eventually became my job. I started making them in 2010, um, originally actually specializing in outreach videos. So I went to Oxford from a state comprehensive school. I was the only person in the history of my school to study physics there. So basically, I started making videos that I thought would be useful to kids who were a couple of years younger than me, helping them through the admissions process. But since then, I've sort of diversified. Uh, I've done videos on the process of writing a PhD thesis, um, the series that we'll talk about today about sci-fi planets, and then this was the actual content of my uh, thesis. Uh, and I've been doing this full time since 2018. Uh, as well as making videos, I also uh, stream on Twitch. I host a podcast called The Wikicast, and last year I wrote a book called Firmament. And all of these fall under the umbrella of science communication, which is actually not often defined, I think, for the public. So I, I like using this definition, um, which is very academic. But it's an activity that enhances public scientific awareness, understanding literacy and culture by building AEIOU responses. Nothing to do with Old MacDonald, that stands for awareness, enjoyment, interest, opinion forming, and understanding. So science communication is an activity where you're trying to elicit one of these responses. But I think that that definition is actually only part of the story. The other part of the story, as, alongside what you're talking about, is who you are talking to. And another definition that I'd like you to come away with today is science capital. This is much less talked about, but I think just as important. And this is basically how into science you are. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean your level of qualification, whether you're an undergrad or a postgrad. It could mean, do you watch YouTube videos about science? Or do you know someone who works in science? How much do you identify with it as a concept? These two definitions together sort of define my approach. My overall approach when it comes to SciComm can be summarized in three words. Communication is storytelling. A story is just a sequence of information that you give in a specific order to an audience to elicit a response. In the case of fiction, that's normally an emotional response. In the case of nonfiction, it can be emotional, but more often than not, it's an intellectual response. And so the same principles apply when you're talking about science as when you're telling a good story around a campfire. And there are two components to consider that are related to those two definitions. First of all, you've got the story itself. You've got the beat 
limits of what you're talking about. And in this case, we're talking about the, the physics of atmospheres and planets. The other component that everybody forgets to talk about is where the science capital part comes into it, which is the format, the frame that you put that story in. And by format, I mean the method of delivery, so whether you're making a YouTube video or a book or a film, and also the context that you are telling your story in. So if you want to talk about radiative balance and what affects the uh, average temperature of a planet, whether you are doing that in the context of a book that is quite explicitly about the history of climate change, or if you're talking about the average temperature of Coruscant in the Star Wars universe. Very different contexts that work for very different audiences. So when I'm approaching any project, first of all, ask, what are my learning objectives? Which of those A, E, I, O, U responses am I trying to go for? And this is probably the influence of my teacher wife. I think of it in terms of learning objectives now. Secondly, which audience specifically am I trying to reach? And this is another important thing to take away from this. There is no such thing as a general audience. If you are talking about science, you're not trying to talk to everyone. You're talking to a demographic, which could be based on location or age or gender or an existing interest, like in Star Wars for example. And then, with your answers to those two questions, ask how does that audience typically consume media about the subject that I want to talk about, that my learning objectives are centered on? And those are the three questions at the top of every script that I write for a YouTube video and the top of every book project that I conceive of. And um, it's important to note these always, don't always come in order. Sometimes you will come up with a project, I want to talk about this and I want to talk about it in this format. Right, who am I talking to in this case? And that informs then the details of how you write the script, how you make the video. So to give you an example, uh, this was a video I made a little while ago called Whatever Happened to Global Cooling? This is based on the idea that was prevalent in the 1970s, that the Earth was actually cooling down rather than warming up. And this has become a talking point amongst uh, right-wing pundits that scientists don't know what they're talking about, they can't make their minds up because, you know, it used to be global cooling and now it's climate change and all that kind of thing. It was a scientific idea, but it was always a small minority of the literature, if you actually look at the number of papers published. So the learning objectives with this were asking make the audience aware of where they get information from. Who are they listening to when it comes to talking about science? And in parallel with that, understanding how science changes over time when new data comes to light and new hypotheses are tested. The audience, uh, people who are skeptical about anthropogenic climate change, and the way that they typically consume media was sweaty, red-faced men getting very angry at a camera. So that was reflected in the design of the project and how I wrote the script, but also in the uh, title and the thumbnail, the fact that it's Global Calling in all capital letters matches what that audience expects from how they typically consume media. Another example would be this video I made um, basically training an AI to play Warhammer 40,000, uh, which you can you know, see exactly what I'm going for here. We're talking about machine learning. We're talking about this idea of competitive self-play. So training an algorithm to play the game and then making it fight another algorithm that's trained to play in the game and whoever wins gets to stay on, competitive self-play. And how those people consume that media is reflected in the thumbnail with the recognition of the Space Marine, but also how I constructed the video. The half of the video was a, a battle report. So really, what I'm getting at in this talk is the general point is that format is king. When you are designing a project of science communication, which is just a form of storytelling, you pick the format that maximizes the chance of your chosen audience reaching your chosen learning objectives. And that means the method of delivery, so mostly for me that means a YouTube video, but also how you choose to talk about those subjects. And the key thing is you're reducing the barrier between your audience and the subject matter. You're removing any cognitive dissonance between your audience and the subject that you want to talk about. So on Twitch, for example, when I stream, I used to do past papers. I would go through physics and maths A-level papers, trying to help kids with their revision. But I'd do it in a way that was exactly the same as a gaming person on Twitch. So there was me in a little corner of the screen, and I'd have sort of sound effects and sort of screen wipes, and there was a top-down camera of me writing. Apart from the, the content, the form exactly match what those people were expecting. And so it meant that there were no barriers between them and the learning objectives that I was trying to reach, at least in theory. Now, the two sort of big examples that I can give you of how I, I do this, first of all, is vlogging. As some of you uh, may have seen, I made this series of videos, I think there are about 30 of them in the end, on life as a PhD student here at Exeter. With the idea being I was aiming for that low science capital audience, so relatively young people who weren't necessarily interested in science, but talking about science and the fact that it, sorry, but the fact that it wasn't a format tradition used for Psycom was definitely an advantage, with the idea being contextualizing the scientific process and scientists themselves. So the key idea was showing that scientists 
This is how you do a PhD. This is the level of knowledge that's required. This is how frequently my code doesn't work and how I keep trying and failing and trying and eventually it succeeds. And that's how scientists are. They're real people that also like other things like singing and, and Warhammer and sci-fi universes. And um, you know, that, that was the whole design of that project. And the other thing to mention is from a practical perspective, it was also, um, you know, I could make it when I was a student. You just needed one of these. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a full-blown production. Compared to... The meat of sort of what I think people are going to be interested in is sci-fi planets. And this series that I made with the wonderful Dr. Hannah Wakeford, some of you may be aware of her. She's sort of world famous now. She's been on TV, but she's now at the University of Bristol as a lecturer. Um, we made a series of videos asking, could planets from various sci-fi universes exist? Uh, we've done five of these so far. We may end up doing more. And the project design here is pretty obvious, right? You can see who we're aiming for. There's a specific audience, and there's very specific learning objectives when it comes to the physics and the history of, 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 of planetary science. And um, doing it in this way allowed for surprisingly detailed discussion of key concepts in a very bite-sized manner within planetary science. And also, as a production standpoint, it was very nerdy fun. Uh, it's something that I originally started right at the end of my PhD, and so I needed something sort of, I suppose, to distract me from uh, the hell of trying to write up. Uh, and it was, it was a fun project to work on, and that's why we made so many of them. So what I thought I'd do um, for the uh, time that I've got left is talk through some of the planets that we analyzed and identify the learning objectives, and then also maybe get into a couple of details of how we practically did it. So to begin with, you can do some very obvious learning objectives, and we can start with maybe the most famous planet in science fiction, big asterisk, uh, which would be Tatooine. Um, so uh, for those, somehow if you're here and you don't know what Tatooine is, um, it's a desert planet from Star Wars. Uh, it's full of uh, coarse, rough, irritating sand. Uh, and uh, perhaps one of the most visually distinctive features, it had this double sunset. So this was one of the first planets that we wanted to talk about, and we realized early on that you could spend an entire video just talking about the science of Tatooine. But we wanted to drill into just that double sunset feature. I think the video in the end is about 18 minutes long, and we covered every planet in Star Wars. So we didn't have very much time to do many learning objectives for each one. So the learning opportunity here, and the learning objective, was can you get a planet in a binary or a trinary or a quaternary system? And the answer is yes. There are absolutely planets that exist in multiple stellar systems. Alpha Centauri, the Centauri system, is an example that's very, very near to us. We also have the discussion of breathable atmospheres. Tatooine is pretty functionally like Mars. It just has a much thicker, breathable atmosphere. And there was a question that we asked each other about, well, is that actually realistic? Could you have a desert planet that doesn't have a large biosphere that has enough oxygen in the atmosphere? And we realized early on there's quite a big hand wave you can do, which is, well, on geological time scales, if all the plants were to disappear from Earth, they would probably be fine for like a few tens of millions of years, breathable oxygen. So sure, let's not worry about that. We're not going to get bugged down into that detail. We can hand wave and talk about geological time. So the verdict with Tatooine was, yes, it's absolutely possible. And Tatooine was one of these planets that had lots of information about. There was a whole Wikipedia article, sorry, there's a whole Wikipedia article about it because Star Wars fans. Um, but some of the planets that we ended up looking at had very, very little information to go on, and so we made these quite marginal calls. One example of that was the planet of Rhea from the MCU. Does it, put your hand up if you recognize the planet of Rhea from the MCU. Exactly. Oh, one person at the back. So this is from a really rapid fire sequence in the middle of Guardians of the Galaxy 2, where they're like jumping from gate to gate, and you see a planet for like a shot at a time. And we did like a rapid fire round in the middle of the video, because we covered every planet in the MCU. And in this case, uh, we decided to focus on the Aurora. I mean, we didn't have very much else to focus on. Um, and so the Aurora here, you can see it's like a green sky, which fine, there are lots of different ways that that could be the case. Orange aurora is quite unusual. And so we sort of took this opportunity to very briefly ask, what are aurora? Why are they the color that they are? And the, the reason they're the color they are is because it's a plasma that has a very specific wavelength that it emits when it's excited. So in Earth's atmosphere, it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen. So you mostly get sort of greens and occasionally red when high atmospheric oxygen is uh, excited. But it allowed us to talk about exoplanet atmospheres. What are the gases we see on exoplanets? And uh, Hannah, this was her verdict, said that the most likely uh, way that this would be orange would be uh, calcium, which is one of the most common metals in the universe, but isn't one that we see in exoplanet atmospheres. So unless there's some really exotic outgassing method, we ruled that this one wasn't possible. 
Another planet that we didn't have a huge amount of information about was uh, Titan II, I think that's the official name, uh, which is the planet that, spoilers, I guess, uh, Thanos goes through the portal to at the end of Avengers Infinity War, and he gets uh, about a foot taken off his height at the start of Avengers Endgame. Um, and um, this is basically a terrestrial planet. I think we have about two exterior shots of this planet. This is one of them from Endgame um, that you see has a ring system. And this was even less information to go on because we had to make the video about a day, or well, finish the video, about a day after Endgame came out. So I came out of my midnight screening of Endgame with like two scribbled notes that basically said ring system, and that was it. So very, very little to go on. But it allowed us to talk about ring systems and the real world analog for terrestrial planets with rings. Because in the solar system, we see planets with rings, but they're all gas or uh, ice giants. And so we point out that, well, there's actually Almea, which is a, a trans-Neptunian dwarf planet that has a well-observed ring system. So if that's the only thing about this planet, if it's Earth with a ring system, sure, absolutely possible. But we may have noticed that most of the, well, all the planets I've talked about so far are quite boring. Uh, they're basically just Earth or Mars or, you know, a planet that we have seen with, you know, a little bit of spice thrown into it. Sorry, we haven't done Arrakis, actually. Um, but one planet that's completely different from what we see in the solar system was Mordian. So this is a planet from Warhammer 40,000, and it was a tidally locked planet. So... Uh, as I'm sure if you're here, you're aware, a tidally locked planet is where the day is as long as a year. The rotational rate matches the rate of uh, orbiting around the star. And um, in Mordian's case, uh, I don't know if you can tell because it's quite a low-resolution image, but all the cities are on the uh, night side of Mordian. It's very, very close to the sun. Uh, the Wikipedia says it's a truly miserable world to live upon, uh, which is probably why they have one of the most famous regiments in the, uh, in the setting that everybody wants to leave and join the army. Um, and the, the, the opportunity here was obvious. We wanted to talk about tidally locked planets. Planets. And this was one of Hannah's favorite subjects to talk about because tidally locked planets are really cool. Climatologically speaking, there's lots of interesting science going on there. And also, you don't see them in science fiction all of that much. There's, I think, three that we may have come across. There were two in Star Trek, and there was this one in uh, Warhammer. I may be forgetting a couple of others. Um, but it allowed us to really dive into, you know, the research into exoplanets and which section would be habitable. How far away from the star would you have to be? What about the atmospheric circulation? How broad would the temperate zone between between the night side and the day side B. Um, and in this case, we've uh, we ruled that it was possible. But if we are talking about boring planets, so just give me a moment here to complain about Star Trek. Um, then, oh, I get it. Star Trek was limited by how much money they had to make the episodes, but it basically meant that every planet was Space California. Um, almost every episode was filmed within like a 10-mile radius of each other, and so you end up getting some really dull planets. I, we, we split up every single planet from the series in my Discord community, because there are 176 episodes, I think, of Star Trek, and uh, we divided it by season, and everybody went through the Wikipedia articles and identified planets. And I think maybe 10% of them were actually kind of interesting. Well, Nora uh, was one of them. This is from uh, season one, so you know it's a bad episode. Um, and uh, what we chose to focus on here was the color. So you can see that it's a red planet. And we sort of use this as a, a jumping off point, really, because there's loads of reasons why a planet could be red. Uh, Mars, for example, it could just be iron oxide. But you saw that it was actually quite a lush planet. There was, uh, there were plant life, was, sorry, plant life on the surface. And so we took this to ask, well, could that work? Could you actually get planets with red plants? Why are they green on Earth? And that led us to talking about um, sort of, you know, how uh, photosynthesis develops. Oh, that's so strange. There should be a picture at the bottom. There it is. Um, uh, why, why are plants on Earth green? And it's basically an interesting question that no one quite knows the answer to, but the working hypothesis is that green is the color. Chlorophyll being green means that it absorbs enough sunlight, but not so much that it heats up too much and denatures the proteins in plants. So if Onara were to be around a much cooler star, but a lot closer, so you had a similar uh, sort of insulation, then yeah, sure, you could imagine that there would be a configuration where plants could be red. Or alternatively, it could be iron oxide. But that would make for a slightly more boring video. And this was an interesting point to talk about. Another uh, area that we delved into was geological history. So uh, Mustafar and Hoth uh, are two planets from Star Wars, uh, home of the barbecue and the freezer, respectively. Um, and so you've got a lava planet and an ice ball. And another thing to point out, actually, is that 
you may have noticed, almost all of these planets are uniform. They all have the same biome everywhere, which isn't what we see on Earth. There are lots of different climatological zones, depending on how you define them. But in this case, it actually made sense because we could look through Earth's geological history and point out that, well, Mustafar is basically what the Earth looked like during the Hadean period, when the Earth was still forming, when it was extremely hot. And Hoth is basically what Earth was like during one of the hypothesized snowball Earth periods, when feedback loops basically meant that the entire planet was covered with ice. Breathable atmosphere makes absolute sense, um, but it doesn't make sense for Mustafar, because if you look at a planet that has a molten surface, the, surf the atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide and methane. So um, it probably means that you wouldn't want to be breathing on the surface. Side note, if you talk about this stuff to Star Wars fans, the number of comments you get saying that Jedi can do X, Y, Z, or, oh, you can't rule that because Jedi aren't like normal humans. It's like, Come on, work with us. Um, so yeah, it allowed us to talk to that and allowed us to, to also, yes, also compare with other planets and moons. So Hoth is basically like Europa, just with a uh, breathable atmosphere. So in this case, not possible slash possible. A couple more. Uh, Kaldos uh, was from uh, the episode Sub Rosa of TNG. I'm just looking, yep, there's at least one person who remembers how terrible that episode was. It's the one with Beverly uh, Crusher and a ghost. Um, and uh, this was a very strange planet because um, for some reason, the colonists of Kaldos decided that they were going to geoengineer the planet to give it a very specific climate. And a whole hemisphere of the planet has one climate. And if you imagine all the countries on Earth where you would pick the climate to match, they picked Scotland. So the entire planet is, is just dreary and dreek and has people with really unconvincing accents. Um, uh, and that gave us an opportunity to sort of talk about climatic zones, right? So if the entire planet is exactly Scotland, what does that mean? Well, if you want to talk about the, the Cook and Geiger system, where you define a climate based on precipitation and temperature, this is going to be oceanic maritime. So there's a very specific set of conditions which you could meet if you had lots of lakes or lochs around the entire planet, lots of available moisture. But the fact that it's a hemisphere, there's an entire hemisphere, means that it's not meridionally symmetric. It's only one hemisphere, not the other one. And then the only way that you're going to get an entire hemisphere to match is if you have really strong heat transport from the equator towards the poles and lots of moisture being trans transported in a really even manner. That would cover the entire planet, not just one hemisphere. So in this case, mercifully, uh, we said that the planet wasn't possible. And that just leaves me with one more which I've included to demonstrate that you can actually talk about a whole load of different areas of science that are not immediately apparent from talking about science fiction. And that's the planet of Oliensis uh, from uh, the 40K universe. And this is a, a planet in a region where uh, sort of hell, the, the Empyrean, uh, bleeds into real space. So it's not really a planet. It's an enormous, uh, enormously overweight man. And this was uh, custom artwork that I got made for the video. And I had the most disgusting email chain, possibly in my entire life, talking about how big do you want the, uh, the lakes of sweat to be? Uh, or how many piercings is too many piercings? And you'll notice that there's a little city right on his ass. Um, but, so that was a fun set of emails to have. Um, but this was an interesting opportunity, because you know, this weird thing existed in the setting. And it allowed us to talk about, well, what about heat production? How do different sized animals like mice or elephants or blue whales produce heat? And you can talk about things like power laws. So, well, the amount of heat that you produce within a life form is proportional to the cube of its radius, but the amount of energy that you can radiate to space is proportional to the square of its radius. So there comes a point where the metabolism of this guy has to be absolutely minuscule in order for it to work, so small that it just wasn't compatible with biological functions. I did actually get a medical doctor to rule on this, and I think his first response was, what? Um, so the ruling was definitely not possible. So those were, those were I think, eight or ten of the planets that, that we looked at. And based on those, I do have a plea. If, anybody, if you're part of this society, if you're interested in this, you may well want to write science fiction yourself. And so I've got some advice for you. If you want to come up with fictional planets, for the love of God, don't look up to Star Trek as the example of what you can do. You can be so much more interesting. There are so many weird and wonderful planets out there. Some examples of what you could look at. 
hot Jupiters or hot Neptunes, these uh, gas giants that orbit really, really close to their stars and have their atmospheres being stripped off. We actually wrote an episode of Star Trek for as an extra video that went on Nebula, um, which was based around a, a hot Neptune, I think. Um, and uh, really interesting sort of ideas for peril with how intense the winds are and how the atmosphere is being, being blown away. Uh, talk about more tidally locked planets. Um, they are actually the most common type of terrestrial planet that we have identified because of biases in how we detect these planets. So there's lots of reasons to talk about them. Um, tightly packed moons. Put lots of moons in like a Jovian type system where there's lots of tidal heating as the moons move past each other with uh, unpredictable geological movements. Really interesting setting. Ocean worlds. Apart from Interstellar, which doesn't count because it's a terrible movie, you don't really see ocean worlds all of that often in science fiction. I'd like to see more of them. Um, having highly stratified atmospheres. An episode of um, Star Trek Deep Space Nine did a really interesting um, Jovian planet where they were basically doing a submarine movie where the further they went into the atmosphere, they went into different layers and were effectively being crushed. It was sort of Hunt for Red October meets Star Trek, which was amazing. More of that. Um, Non-uniform climatic zones. It doesn't have to be the entire planet. In fact, it's not realistic for it to be the entire planet. Um, and then a personal favorite, talk about cryovolcanism. This idea of uh, places like Oberon, where um, water, liquid water, fills effectively the same niche as liquid rock does on Earth. Loads of interesting things you can do with water volcanoes, water being heated by geological processes. Um, but also, Run ideas past scientists. It may not come as a surprise to you, but when I spoke to scientists getting verdicts on these things, Hannah most of all, but also other people, big old nerds, they love talking about this stuff within a fictional setting. They would love it if you ran ideas past them and said, would this be possible? How would you design a planet like this? So I'd implore you to do that. But anyway, that, that's sort of me going off my soapbox for writers. In terms of what we talked about today, Number one, I want you to come away with the idea that when you're talking about science communication, as with any kind of communication, you are telling a story. SciComm is storytelling. And when you are telling a story, you have to be extremely specific in what you are trying to accomplish, who you are talking to, and what you want that audience to come away understanding, or being aware of, or being interested in. The, um, to effectively communicate, you have to consider how that specific audience uses the specific delivery method that you are, want to make a product in and how they, are, uh, how they consume media and what they are aware of within, for example, a fictional setting like Star Wars and how you can use that to maximize the chance of reaching your learning objectives. In my particular case, we've certainly found that planets in science fiction work. They get people interested. There's something that's very visually distinctive on YouTube specifically, gets people watching the video, and then you're kind of learning by stealth. You're learning in the same way that I made um, vlogs about the scientific process. You're learning whilst also enjoying it and not necessarily realizing that you're learning. And then, really, I suppose, the, the, the thesis statement of this entire talk was science communication, and a lot of communication generally, comes down to framing. The frame that you put your story in and the context that you are telling that story within. But that's enough from me. Uh, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, thank you very much for listening.